This one time in Kyrgyzstan, I ran for my life. I was there teaching a course, and my host, Boris, invited me to lunch. His choice was the cafeteria at the American University of Bishkek for an entirely unsolicited taste of home. On the way, we zoomed past truck after truck loaded up with soldiers. We had figured on their way to some training or another. No big whoop. Flash forward to lunch. The food was predictably terrible, but that's besides the point. Pop, 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 gunfire erupted outside the cafeteria window. A lot of gunfire. So, like morons, we went to take a look-see. Full-on insurrection, a formal, armed, thousands-deep invasion of the presidential palace. As soon as we discovered what was unfolding, we hopped into Boris's car, and despite a citywide lockdown, we hightailed it to his family home on Lake Isik, far to the east. After a blur of swervy, dusty mountain roads, we required some kind of shake-off and went for a hike. As we passed by a stunningly appointed lakefront orchard gazing across the water at a dramatic alpine ridge, a traditionally garbed girl of no more than eight descended from a ladder materializing from the sun-kissed fluff of a cherry tree. She shyly approached us and handed us each a single sour cherry. Fruit warmed by the midday sun, plump from the season and ripe as the day was hot, this thing burst with relief upon contact. Now that was one revolutionary cherry. My name is Howie Southworth. I travel, I eat, I cook, and then I write fancy words about all of it. My cookbooks are loaded with wild stories and fabulous bites, and I've shared plenty of my own adventures. But now, I want to hear somebody else's for a change. Sauced in Translation is a timely podcast spanning the globe of food, spinning tales of lavish meals and epic gastronomic failure. Join us for some well-deserved armchair globetrotting. Let's get saucy. My guest this week is Greg Matza. Where do I even begin? If you don't recognize that name, you're in that special column of folks that is about to realize that you should know that name. He is my brother from another mother, the Millie to my Vanilli, the Humperdinck to my Engelberg. Long story short, he and I started our creative partnership at a staff retreat ahead of our first summer working for the Family Vacation Center at UC Santa Barbara. That's right, family camp, and I do mean camp. He or I started singing Hey There from Pajama Game, and the other joined in from across the room. And that was our first collaboration in entertainment. Since then, we've produced two plays, four cookbooks, three web series, one film, and dozens and dozens of unfinished works of brilliance. Sure, he's a successful Silicon Valley salesman, and his common-law father-in-law, um, father in common-law? Oh, whatever. Just won the Nobel Prize in economics, but... At the end of the day, he's my oldest friend, one with whom I share 23 years of travel stories. Man, do we eat well. Here's our chat. Let me ask you a question. It's been a weird year. How you been feeding yourself? Is that what are we're you, supposed to be talking about? <laughs> are, you, are you part of the sourdough club now? Or were you the no, banana, banana bread I've, guy? I've baked not at all. Um. Part of it is that uh, my partner, Jen, she is uh, Mm gluten-free and she's been through three different phases of uh, eating plans, none of which have included grains. So for the most part, when I've been cooking for us, I've been cooking sort of uh, low on the carbs. And when I cook for me, it's kind of too much to like try to make a... uh, a loaf of bread just for me. Because what happens is if I cook a loaf of bread just for me, guess who eats a whole loaf of bread? You. This guy. You know, you could freeze bread, right? (laughs) You could put that right in the freezer. You you can. The funny part is the phases. The first three to four months, I mean, we ate like kings. Everything that takes a long time to cook, I mean, braises and beans and it was, a, it was an opportunity that, to actually cook all those things because you can't do it when you go to work every day and you're too tired on the weekends or you're off doing something. And then there was sort of that ennui phase. It went for two to three months where mm-hmm. I think I ate largely citrus, rice cakes with honey, 
Trader Joe's tamales. Ooh, good. Yeah, those were good. The chicken green chili ones. Yeah, they got rid of them, though. <gasps> they don't have them out here anymore. I warmed. I didn't cook. Yep, yep, yep. I get I just you. Got, I just got bored. I just got bored of cooking. I got bored of eating. I got bored of everything. I got bored of Jen. I got bored of my house. We got bored of everything. And then it all broke up. And I'll tell you how it broke up because I think it's an interesting story. It has to do with travel. We were supposed to go to Thanksgiving. If you remember in the fall, pandemic numbers were pretty low. And we were all going to get tested. By all, I just mean Jen, her dad, her dad's wife, and her stepbrother and his wife. So the six of us were going to get together to a house in uh, Humboldt County. As happened everywhere, right before Thanksgiving, the numbers like shot through the roof. And it was very clear that it wasn't advisable for us to get together. But meanwhile, you know, we're cheap. We had rented this house for the month uh, and it was going to go empty and it had a hot tub. So Jen and I went up to the, uh, to the house in Humboldt County. Beautiful. Got us out of the house. Nice drive. Saw the big sequoias. But more importantly, for Thanksgiving dinner, we weren't bound by the normal Thanksgiving dinner stuff because it was just the two of us. And so what did I make? But the, the one thing that stands out and that sort of re-inspired my cooking came from an Ottolenghi book, and it was uh, these stuffed Roma tomatoes. And they were stuffed with such a crazy array of things. I don't know if you've ever made food uh, from Ottolenghi, but he's like a mad scientist. Parsley, capers, um, those brine dried Syrian olives. Okay. Yeah. You know, if you try to eat them straight, they're like so salty. Oh yeah. You can't do it. You can't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and a ton of herbs. So basically it was like super salty, super pickled, super briny. And then just like a load of different herbs, parsley and cilantro and so on. And I didn't know what the hell it was going to taste like. It's out of language. You never know what you're in for. It's hard to tell, isn't it? It's hard to tell. And I made it and it was so good. Wow. Oh, so good. And from there, that was in November, I've been sort of back on the train. I, I stopped buying the rice cakes. I stopped buying the tamales. And, you know, spring is coming. So the vegetables are getting really good. Uh, you know, starting to make some salads. We found something called a, a Valentine Tangelo. Have you What's... run into a Valentine? No, sorry. Oh, no, tell me about a Valentine that. Pomelo. A Valentine Pomelo. Tell me about it. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> this thing is as big as your head. You crack that thing open, and it is a fruit like you have never tasted before. The closest I can give you mm -hmm. is, you know when you have a snow cone, and there's that uh, juice at the bottom of the snow cone that's the combination of all the artificial flavors? Yeah, imagine that mixed with a grapefruit. I'm trying to imagine why this is called a Valentine Pomelo. It's sort of a reddish shade inside, like a deep red shade, like a heart. And it probably comes out around February. Tell us about your last great trip <laughs> and what <laughs> you ate. Well, I was still telling you about the pandemic. You read... <laughs> You reached phase seven, and phase seven was not very entertaining because you were peeling citrus on success. No, you don't peel a citrus. You slice a citrus. People who peel citrus are doing it wrong. It's like a banana. How do you open a banana, Howie? Tell us about your last great trip and what you ate. Friend, I don't remember my last great trip. I think it was our trip to China. We brought along our friend Ray. What did we eat on that trip? God, it seems like 20 years ago. I think it's COVID fever. It seems like so, it seems like a different world. So let me let me inspire you a little bit. So my yeah. my favorite moment, my most memorable food moment from that trip. And what we did was we took uh, a, a train as far west uh, into central China as we could. So we went to Xi'an after going to um, uh, visit uh, the, the the Jewish beginnings in Kaifeng. We headed west to Xi'an, and then we went northwest 
to the town of Xining, which starts mm-hmm. kind of the Great Plain of northern China. And it was a uh, the Muslim population is very, very big. And we wanted nothing after a hot day of walking around than some cold beers and a lot of good fatty food. And we walked into the nicest restaurant we could possibly find. And it was a devout Muslim owner who had uh, offered us tea. We ordered beer. He said, we don't serve any beer. And we proceeded to have what was perhaps the best meal of the trip. If you recall, they served us this honey black tea. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And it that was, was a great meal. It was, it took me by complete surprise because I said, well, screw this. I wanted a night where we were just cutting loose in a hole in the wall, eating our favorite Chinese foods and drinking lots of cold beer. Uh, and that's not what we got. And I was kind of disappointed in the very beginning. After we looked at the menu, the food started coming out and we were getting some dishes that we've never seen before. Yeah. This, this mashed potato and chilies dish, this thin lamb that was coated with cornstarch and thinly and layered with thinly cut eggplant, deep fried. Uh, and man, that tea, we must have drank uh, <laughs> among the three of us. We probably finished four or five pots of this stuff each because it was really addictive. And I yeah. remember the evening turning around, we were in this lavish, hot pink couch room eating this meal that we did not deserve and we didn't aim for. Part of it was we had this odd situation where we were walking and walking and walking, looking for a place to eat, which is not common because usually there's too many restaurants to try stuff. We kept walking around and we couldn't find a restaurant. Like we had to split up the three of us to look for a restaurant. We were like, okay, you go that direction. You go that direction. I'll go here. We'll be back here in five minutes because we went up and down and up and down the streets and could That's, not find a place. Yes, that eat. is not typical. That is not no, typical of our China experience. The whatsoever. Opposite. One of the things that, that I treasure as a culinary experience from that trip. And uh, we had made a trip to Xi'an when researching our Chinese street food book. And in going around the city, we found the best egg sandwich in the history of egg sandwiches. Imagine the flakiest, butteriest croissant, stretched out, pounded out, rolled up, fried right in front of your eyes, sliced in half, then they fry an egg right in front of you. And that egg was probably inside a chicken three hours ago. I mean, a fresh egg. The crispiest, flakiest, butteriest croissant you've ever had. Mm. Could you imagine the skill it takes to slice that in half? <laughs> Remember that night we, we found ourselves like way off in a, in a corner of China. If I recall, the city is called like Zhengye. Something I had never seen in China, essentially a food court. I would say about a half acre, just filled with like picnic style tables all throughout the middle. And along the edges are probably 20 or 25 different independently owned, just family restaurants. I mean, this is the perfect place to go. I want one style of food. You want another. I like this family's food. You like that one. We go there. We meet. We each grab our food. We eat together. And it was a lot of fun. It sort of reminded me of like an Oktoberfest because there were so many people eating at these great big communal tables. So even though we're, the three of us are eating together, it felt like we were eating with the whole community. I don't see it as, you know, Ray wants this, you want that, and I want a, a third separate thing. My problem was that I wanted nine different things. Yeah. So there was a dumpling place, and there was a mm. Muslim restaurant, and there was this uh, chow bula place. And we'll get to that in a minute because this is one of the more unique foods. And then there was a bodega kind of place where you could buy cold beers. And you could buy napkins because those weren't issued either. Uh, and like you can make yourself a little, essentially a picnic where you order, you take a number, and that individual little stall brings the food out to you because they look for your number amidst, you know, China's an amazing place. They find you amidst thousands of people. It was like the, the court employed like a bunch of, I don't know, 17-year-old boys, let's say. And they would 
just grab the food and bring it to you. I didn't check their cards. I don't know. I, how I old didn't. They I, I'm just, but young, young folk, young folk. Should, they weren't old enough to vote. Okay. Oh, wait. This is China. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, now we're banned. Good no, no. one. <laughs> Great. Good thing nobody listens to this. But there was this place and it was right in the corner. And they made something called Chaobula. Now, Chaobula is apparently uh, something regional to this far off northwestern corner of China. I think of it as basically Chinese fajitas. And they heat a two and a half foot diameter iron skillet. They fry up the onions. They fry up the peppers. They fry up the meat. And then comes the magic. They fried up bread and then on the fiery hot skillet that's just covered in oil and salt and fat they fry the bread in with their fajitas you know it's it actually bears the the end result bears a striking resemblance to and you'll laugh when i say this but thanksgiving stuffing it's a seasoned uh you know mirepoix or a seasoned onions and peppers and garlic and ginger and like all this stuff and then oh. that bread that bread just soaks everything up like a i mean i i see where you're getting at with the stuffing because the bread provides a, a a locality on your tongue to that's right. combine all those flavors that's right and that wonderful fat from the pan it's but from a from yeah. a taste standpoint it tasted nothing like stuffing but there's no wrong way to think of it no uh, and certainly the and certainly the cumin and the chilies make liken oh. it much more to the mexican fare than it would ever yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's an, that's an interesting point a lot of the a lot of the food up in the northwest has a lot of cumin so so the flavors in this are probably uh predominantly garlic chili and cumin yeah mm -hmm. there might have been mm -hmm. some ginger in there i really enjoyed that that meal i but i also enjoyed just the fun of eating in that communal hall and especially now in these covid times where um you know we're, we're so lonely that mm -hmm. memory of sharing a meal with a thousand of our closest friends is really warm in my heart greg tell me what is your favorite Travel food story. Whew, there's so many. Um, I work in Silicon Valley and uh, ended up just with like a week's notice uh, having to travel to uh, Bangalore, a place I'd never been. I'd never been to India, but no time to really figure out where I was going to stay or anything like this. I just had to very quickly arrange everything and, and get there. And so I show up in, in uh, Bangalore knowing very little. I meet my client and, and, and uh, we're getting along great. And she says, well, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to show you some, I'd love to show you around the city. I said, oh, you know, it's imposing upon you. It's fine. I can eat at the hotel. She says, no, no, no. She took me to a place called Maya's in Bangalore. We had a 30, three zero course vegetarian meal. 30 what? courses. 30 courses. Which is so much more food than it sounds like. Like you think that sounds like a lot of food. Wait till you try to eat it. Well, I think 30 bites sounds like a lot. So if well, every course was more than a bite, that's a lot, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's essentially what it was, was, you know, I, as I said, I've eaten Indian food for a, a long time. I've lived in the Bay Area my whole adult life. Uh, I thought I understood Indian food. I did not understand Indian food, right? I understood Indian food that's made it over here. Each course was so different. I mean, there were a few that I recognized, but probably there were 20 new tastes. I don't even know what I was eating. It was astonishing. But the funniest part was we sit down and there were three of us at the meal, me and my customer, her boyfriend, and we're just having a nice chat. And over comes the guy to serve the first course, and he serves it onto my plate, a tablespoon of food. Wow. I said, that's what they give you? This is weird. Like a, a whole big plate, and you've got one tablespoon on there. And my friend says, oh, you, trust me. Trust me. You'll be happy. That's all he's giving you. <laughs> and, you know, you take a couple small bites. You don't stick the whole thing. It's not like sushi where you put it all in your mouth at once. You take, I don't know, three or four small bites of it. And I mean... Like any good Indian food, it's a it's an explosion. It, it's 15 different spices all in harmony with each other. And all you want to do is have more of that. Man, that takes some discipline. 
Right. And that's the, the, the culinary equivalent of this is a marathon, not a sprint. Oh yeah. This thing took at least two and a half, three hours. I think My God. I kept wanting more and they would serve you more. But my friend was like, do not ask for more. Trust me. <laughs> By about 18, you start to understand why they're giving you a tablespoon per course because you're just over halfway and you're pretty full because like Indian food, this has a lot of, this has a lot of butter. This has a lot of cream. This is, this is some heavy food by 26, 27. It's still brand new tastes. And I'm so excited for each one. But you're wondering if you could actually finish this thing. I can't do it. And you're praying to the culinary gods. I can't do it anymore. Let this be 29. Let this be 30. It's like a good novel. It's like a good novel at two in the morning. And you got a 6 a.m. call. Oof. Can you give us a couple of examples? Like two bites, three bites that you had. Like a slightly roasted shaved coconut with lime, but then savory spices, all mushed up as they tend to do in Indian food into like a stew form. It's very hard to describe. Another one, and there were a few different varieties of this, each tasting quite different, was something that I believe it's called a rasam, a chili-based dish. So sort of like a um, an Indian pasole without the corn or whatever, but it was mostly that that unbelievable flavor of the richness of the chilies. And part of the problem with describing Indian food, and, and I have the same problem when I try to cook Indian food, is I've trained my palate in uh, Mediterranean foods, in uh, especially Mexican, but some other Latin American foods, where I can say, oh, this is missing a little bit of lemon. This is missing a little bit of salt. This is missing a little bit of chili. This is... I, I know what it's missing. And so when I have unbelievably good Indian food, I can't say, oh, this is so fenugreek I just haven't trained myself uh, on those amazing spices like I should. I haven't developed a palate yet. Right. I know, I know what I like, though. And I like Maya's in Bangalore. I hope it's still there, Maya. <laughs> Maya, I hope you made it through the pandemic and you're still serving your 30-course vegetarian meal. What was your worst food experience? Now, we've been in China quite a few times and we enjoyed, we enjoyed hands down most of our food. Oh, yeah. But I happen to know that your answer lies in China. What was your f- worst food experience? <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite places to travel in China, and I know yours as well, Howie, is, uh, is Chengdu. Chengdu is the capital of uh, Sichuan. And we all know Sichuan for Sichuan food, you know, spicy, amazing food. And so we're in Chengdu and we're just going crazy. It's like you're just trying to pass the hours between meals. I'm a big noodle guy. I love noodles. Crazy for Howie, not so much a noodle guy. He had had a bowl of bad noodles. What, when you were teaching English there or something? It was the one time I got sick in China. Yeah. That that makes an impression. I I believe you. How rare an event it was for me to get you to sit down to a plate of noodles. And so we go over to one of the guys eating. And at the time, there weren't very many foreigners in Chengdu. It's not the same now. Uh, But people people are always very friendly, always very happy to speak with us. And we're like, oh, what is this? And we look in his bowl and the noodles are green. Bright green. Like a, like a spinach linguine. It was like, wow, this is wacky. Amazing. And we get those noodles, and I immediately realized that this was a mistake. Big, big mistake. Now, your bigger mistake was convincing me that this might be the noodle that turned me around. That's right. That was a big mistake. Big mistake, because this bowl of noodles, it smelled like a barnyard. And so say, well, you know, if it smells this bad, it must taste great because there's got to be a reason people. (laughs) There are so many examples in the world of things that smell like that, that end up being delicious. That's right. Give me some, give me some examples of that. uh, A durian. Oh, give me a break. Everybody says this. Guess what? 
Dorian smells and tastes exactly the same. Yeah, both horrible. But both, some people love it. Both horrible. But whoever's selling it will 100% of the time say, look, it smells much, much worse than it tastes. And guess what? They're lying. <laughs> well, I guess we were dumb. Because I go and I take a bite and it did, in fact, taste exactly how it smelled. I think the noodles were made of alfalfa. I think I associate that smell with like petting zoos and horse (laughs) barns. And, you know, if I was a horse, I would have loved those noodles. I think that was the last bowl of noodles you tried in China for 10 years. (laughs) Easily 10 years. Yeah. All right, so Greg, we've reached the time in the show where I've got five fill in the blanks for you. Blank will be my last meal. Lots of all soup. I cook blank to impress people. A frittata. I'm sorry, you cook a frittata to impress people? People love a frittata. <laughs> okay, I, I cook blank to comfort myself. Well, there I'll go off the lemon. My family's Greek, so it's a Greek egg lemon soup. The one food I would erase from the earth is those alfalfa noodles. I would have to agree. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, blank is for dinner tonight. Well, I sound like a real Greek here. Uh, Yagantes. Yagantes are like a uh, roasted lima bean uh, in, in tomato sauce. Well, Greg Matza, thank you very much. And that was spectacular. You're a curmudgeon, so you might think otherwise. Well, no, I'm not a curmudgeon. I just think there's a right way to do things, and you do things the wrong way, that's all. I tend to. To all of you wonderful, intelligent listeners out there, remember to subscribe to this show, follow me on Instagram, and find our books with your favorite seller. Those are One Pan to Rule Them All, Kiss My Casserole, How to Cook Anything in Your Dutch Oven, Chinese Street Food, and the forthcoming Off the Top of My Head, Recipes, Rants, and Ravings of an American Cook Obsessing in Barcelona. Until next time, stay saucy and eat well.